Welcome uh, to another Crisis Jam. My name is David Covington. I'm your host today. I'm the CEO and President at RI International, and we've got a, uh, a full uh, hour for you uh, as we press into 2022 and uh, the uh, uh, formal launch of 988 on July 16th that we're uh, barreling towards. Uh, and uh, today, we're so excited uh, to have a uh, special guest and former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, uh, which we'll get to in just a few minutes. And we're going to talk to him about me Medicaid parity and, and crisis services and uh, a, a breakthrough week uh, with the meeting that happened yesterday uh, with the Mental Health Parity Addiction and Equity Act. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward uh, to that discussion. Uh, we continue to grow the, the learning community. Uh, the, um, there are about 2,300 of you who are participating this call week to week uh, as the momentum continues to grow nationally. Uh, keep helping us if there's a national organization. If you're in the call and not referenced, uh, let us know. Uh, and if you're a Medicaid authority, we have all 50 states offices of behavioral health participating. Uh, and would love to have more Medicaid uh, representation, as well as uh, commercial insurers, uh, top leadership, Medicare leadership, et cetera. And we'll get to more of that as, as we get into this call today. Uh, we are continuing to make changes to the uh, learning community homepage at talk.crisisnow.com. Uh, but you'll see today, Patrick Kennedy, uh, as the featured presentation, the Zoom link to get into these meetings is right there. Uh, and as you can also sign up for a newsletter if you'd like a reminder or you'd like to put this in your Outlook calendar, et cetera. And we are uh, publishing weekly the videos, the materials, the quotes, the crisis trivia hot seats and more. Uh, and, and more recently, the state stat cards, these uh, where we're covering states that have put substantial material funding into a crisis system and the core elements of that. Uh, most notably um, marked by state legislation. Uh, so you can see that uh, Virginia is the, the latest addition to those uh, state stat cards. Uh, today's quote uh, comes from Dr. Henry Harbin. So uh, we've been working with Dr. Uh, Harbin relative to uh, the, uh, his um, thinking around how do we do what was done with early intervention services and first break psychosis for beginning to bring a standardized, scalable platform to these vital services so that it's not a state by state or even worse, county by county type of set of solutions. And part of this key is crisis mental health services, Dr. Harbin says, need to be essential services, need to be reimbursed by all insurers, including Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. And yesterday, uh, the, uh, in the news, uh, NASHBID uh, formally released a paper, RI produced it, Paul, uh, uh, again, for those of you who were not on the call earlier, happy birthday to Paul, but Paul was the primary architect and writer of this, partnering with um, uh, Dr. Harbin, Brian Hepburn, myself, and others, and we brought in some real billing experts, Brent, Brenda Jackson, and, and others who uh, Dr. Harbin was able to come, uh, help us uh, to get to coding guidelines to support standardized billing and access to coverage, really, again, with a focus on all insurers. And Paul, the, the goal here was to build on the platform of the SAMHSA National Guidelines. You want to say a word about that? And Dr. Harbin, if you're with us, I'd love to hear a word from you as well. Yeah, so it, it does build on the framework that was already there, just a little bit more detail on how we can potentially create sustainable funding uh, models with very clear, straightforward coding recommendations uh, and structures. Uh, that, that's really where it's at. And uh, Dr. Harbin did some amazing work on uh, really tightening that up and making it a message that I believe is accessible to everybody. Henry, are you with us today? So I, I don't see Dr. Harbin, but he will be a featured presenter in uh, the Crisis Jam coming up on March the 9th. And we'll, we'll have more detail on this report. Uh, but uh, Karen, if you can drop into the chat text, uh, the link to that report uh, on both the crisisnow.com site as well as the learning community site. Uh, not going to uh, spend time on it today, but there's, a, a, there's been a lot of uh, media attention, and most recently the McKinsey report 
uh, around the behavioral health challenges facing Generation Z. Uh, we'll, we'll spend more time on that in a future call. Uh, Kevin Martone, I know you're, you're with us as we're going to be talking about uh, your interview with Stephanie later in the meeting, but you want to say a word or two about the two documents last week and now this week, a federal, federal policy recommendations and state planning guide for Medicaid finance mobile crisis teams. Sure, thanks, David. Hi, everybody. Yeah, we had some funding from California Health Care Foundation and Schusterman Foundation to put out these papers. The first one on federal policy recommendations is really trying to get at um, and really reinforce and support, but also augment some of the work that the federal agencies are doing collaboratively, you know, particularly between CMS and SAMHSA, you know, on block grant funding, um, obviously the new Medicaid mobile um, uh, FMAP provision through ARPA, um, but also even thinking beyond, you know, CMS and, and SAMHSA into other federal agencies that really you know, are triggered in mental health crisis response, you know, the issues that we'll talk about with Stephanie later on homelessness, for instance. Um, and then the second paper that we just, we just put out yesterday is really focused more at state planning implementation on the Medicaid mobile response provisions. You know, states are all in that right now. Some of them have the planning grants from CMS, but others are working on this issue too. And we really wanted to get some, you know, some thoughts out there for states to consider. And in that paper, you know, we, we talked to five different states um, really to understand, you know, what they've been doing, what they are doing as they're thinking forward. We pulled in some other state examples as well, but I think it's a good resource for states that are actually really in this planning stage right now for the, particularly for the Medicaid mobile response. Um, the paper also goes beyond just that, right? We don't just say, well, you know, we're looking at Medicaid mobile response in a vacuum, but really how does that all link into 988, for instance, or crisis stabilization services, for instance, um, you know, as states are working on that. So, uh, I can put those links in here as well. Uh, actually, I think Karen just did. Um, so um, I look forward to uh, folks reading it and welcome any feedback. Uh, great, Kevin. We'll, we'll, and we'll see you again in this uh, uh, jam in a few minutes. But uh, look, the, the, this is a report that's not just strategic. That both these reports are chock full of practical details and uh, really a great resource. So look forward to more on that. Uh, uh, also in the news yesterday, a landmark uh, meeting with the uh, uh, 2022 uh, Mental Health Parity uh, Addiction and Equity Act report to Congress with top leaders from Department of Labor, HHS, Department of the Treasury, et cetera, coming together. But instead of uh, uh, talking about that directly, let's just go straight to our featured presentation. Uh, during his time in Congress, uh, uh, Patrick J. Kennedy was the lead author of the landmark Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, the federal parity law, which requires insurers to cover treatment for mental health and substance use disorders no more restrictively than treatment for illnesses of the body. As founder of the Kennedy Forum, uh, Patrick now unites advocates, policymakers, and business leaders to advance evidence-based practices and policies in mental health and addiction. In 2017, he was appointed to the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis, and currently serves as co-chair of the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention's Mental Health and Suicide Prevention National Response to COVID-19, uh, and co-chair of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Behavioral Health Integration Task Force. Uh, uh, I was electrified, gosh, and, and uh, I don't remember when the uh, former congressman spoke at the National Council, it was probably 20. 13 or 14 in there, Patrick, but I remember uh, just being electrified by this shift away from activism and advocacy as the primary sort of lever and a shift to the law. So tell us about why parity, both the federal law and the framework is so important. Well, thank you so much, David. And I appreciate the incredible work kind of helping everybody lay out a strategy for implementation. There, there cannot be enough said for us having this kind of roadmap paved and, and the uh, mile markers laid out and having, you know, Kevin's presentation on implementation, having Paul's work all kind of feed into this, as well as everyone who's on the call who constantly kind of adds to the mix of, of what it is that's going on out there so we can get real situational awareness. So. Um, parity, obviously, I think is a political tool for us to accomplish a lot of our objectives in terms of, as you pointed out, getting sustainable funding 
that's embedded in the reimbursement system as opposed to relying in the years ahead purely on, on these um, state SAMHSA grants, which of course now because of the increased budget of SAMHSA are, are, are certainly going to be so instrumental in helping us establish these infrastructures, but which of course, in order to bring that sustainable nature to this, we're going to have to get all payers at every level pitching in and kind of determining what that looks like. The way we help achieve that, as I stated just prior to the call, when we were discussing that, is to use the narrative of parity. The narrative of parity is, is much like the narrative of civil rights. Um, separate and unequal um, doesn't work anymore. We have to have uh, mental health fully integrated. We have to have it treated the same. That's a pretty simple, straightforward narrative. And I have found as a political guy that, um, you know, you may not get everybody on board with this quote mental health thing, because of course we know that in spite of the great advances we've made on stigma, there's still a lot of judgment. Um, there's still a lot of um, bigotry and founded in a lot of misperceptions out there around uh, people with mental illness and that the people who are homeless uh, in crisis have themselves to blame, so forth and so on. But I think there's a general appreciation, um, especially post COVID, that everybody's affected, either themselves or their family members, their friends, their colleagues, everybody in some respect. And then it behooves all of us to get this right. And finally, they really get um, that this has been treated uh, unfairly and, and that that is based upon outdated modes of what we know about neuroscience and what we know just generally from um, the experience that we've had over the last several decades and moving forward on this issue. I think that, um, you know, we're, the parity issue is a, is a lever for us to get real dialogue with the payers, um, including the biggest payer of all, CMS. So um, as we know, parity is not equally applied or, or even um, covered by uh, all the biggest violator is Uncle Sam. It, it is CMS, but as we know, uh, CMS is scrambling now, um, as are all the other payers, um, the commercial payers and, and the like. And we're now, I think, really having an opportunity to say this is a matter of social justice and equality, and no one wants to be on the wrong side of that discussion. Uh, I think that you know, we have a very tough job to do in the mental health advocacy world, and that is trying to synthesize the many different fragmented pieces of our movement. But the narrative is very powerful. The narrative is we've got to rectify this historical injustice where we've never paid for this the same way, we've never covered this the same way, and guess what? The, the problem we have today of lack of access that's a direct legacy of past discrimination. That's a direct legacy of our not making the decision a generation ago to invest in these services and this infrastructure. All of that has to change now. But as you know, because we're stuck with half as many, a fraction of as many providers as we need and quadruple the need today than it was even a couple of years ago, we're in a crisis point where the only way we work this out is through collaboration, because there's no way the, the payers are going to get relief um, from being um, violators of parity. And by the way, as you know, CMS has a prospective rule that's now under evaluation for um, network adequacy. You all remember the famous Phoenix VA scandal where veterans couldn't get into the VA in a timely way. And what we did in Congress is we said, if you can't get it in so many days and, and without traveling so many miles, you get access to everything and VA is going to pay for it, which of course meant that the civilian sector opened up uh, as a reimbursable network by the VA. My point is we're crossing the same bridge now with CMS um, with respect to 
to time and distance standards in access to care. And obviously the payers uh, are stuck because they can only enroll so many providers and those providers are a finite bunch of providers. So basically they're gonna be violating this thing whether they want to or not. But what we can do is we can negotiate with them and say, if you make a good effort, which by the way means that you reimburse for these paraprofessionals, these crisis response, these um, network, um, you know, technology centers, uh, you know, if we can get you to pay for these other things, we can help you with your, your status at CMS, with your stars, with your credentialing, which all are going to fall afoul of these new network adequacy standards. So, so there's a real churn and turmoil now in this space. And I think that the effort to stand up a crisis response system is a perfect place for us to get the, um, if you will, the get out of jail card for these big payers to say, listen, we're, we know we're up against the wall here. How else can we help you? Because we're at the end of our rope in terms of being able to field any new providers, but maybe we can do X, Y, and Z. And that's where we can ideally get them to agree to these codes that you're talking about and, and maybe help us set up infrastructure where we do connect to you know, SDOH issues, which are so crucial in stabilization, but which obviously have never been connected to the medical approach in, in crisis response. So happy to answer more questions, but everybody can look on yesterday's report. It was a very damning report. As I said to you prior to the call, um, I've been trying to get parity enforced for over a decade since the bill passed and nothing meant as much as yesterday. Yesterday's um, thorough forensic audit of plans left nothing to doubt that none of the parity, no parity is not being enforced at all. And none of the payers are, are doing a sufficient job in even trying to comply with parity as evidenced by the findings of the Department of Labor, HHS and Treasury uh, report, which represents a huge uh, challenge for payers now, because also within the law, payers are now um, are going to have to produce timely analyses of the comparability between their mental health and physical spend. And that's now part of a, a newer authorization that we got in last year's um, uh, Continuing Appropriation Act language. Mm -hmm. So what that means is it's not just the insurers are going to be on the line, but the fiduciary responsibility for these plans also lies with the real payers who are the employers in this country who have in the past just signed the checks to their third party quote insurers to manage all this thing. They can't afford to do that any longer because there's a real liability on them thanks to the second circuit court, federal court of New York, which determined that a fiduciary applies to the employer as well as their TPA which of course is another leverage on the political side for us to get greater um, input and participation from the business community to help us with 988, right? Because as we know, the telecom folks have fallen back. Well, as you know, this is an existential crisis for all employers. They could be a big political uh, ally of ours if we figure out a strategy to, to know what we want them to do in order to what we want them to push for, but also politically within their own chambers of commerce, what we want them uh, to be supportive of. So parity, as I said, is a lever uh, now that it's getting enforced and, and measured for us to get a lot more on the table for them to pay for than we would have imagined uh, in the past. So Patrick, parity as a, a civil rights movement uh, operationalized through this uh, approach of network sufficiency, adequacy, essential services. Uh, talk a bit, if you would, about the Washington State Insurance Commissioner and the bill that they have 
to define crisis, a mobile crisis receiving facility as part of mandated emergency services and the potential impact that would have on coverage, prior authorization, network status, et cetera. So, you know, really the success we've had the last several years is going through states. Really, it's these um, state insurance commissioners and the state attorneys general who have helped establish the common law standards, right, which have pervaded the country. So when we've gotten, you know, before Schneiderman to do stuff and we got the consent decrees uh, on these payers here or in Pennsylvania, what ended up happening was there's a ripple effect. If you had to eliminate pre-authorization on MAT in New York, I mean, if you're a national payer, just say, let's just do it generally. Um, and so I really like this idea, and that's why there's synergy in all of us working in our respective lo local areas to push this, because a success in one state can have a ripple effect in helping to establish a new expectation of what it should look like in another state. Now, back to civil rights. You know, Thurgood Marshall and the team at NAACP, mm -hmm. they sued where they thought they could get new case law and once they got that case law they knew that it was going to set a new common law standard that's the way we need to think about this so when you've got examples like washington state what that does as a politician if i'm in some other state at the state level i say well geez it's already been done in this state or this state or this state what we need to do is not be the first we just need to replicate what's already going on that has a powerful uh, advantage if you're in the uh, business of trying to get stuff adopted to have those first movers like Washington define the direction um, going forward. You know, and then we've got local initiatives. You know, years ago, thanks to Judge Leifman, as you know, down in Miami Dade, he took the budget for a new jail and he got all that money from the county to put it into more supportive housing, to your earlier point and supported living services. And guess what? The need for the jail dropped. They didn't have to build it. And what's more, they're left with the windfall of dollars because that was gonna be an expensive process of rearrest, adjudication, policing, transportation, probation, um, and so forth. All of which ching, 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 save a ton of money if you take out the person out of that long, chain of the of the justice involved population that continues to to rack up the costs so yeah you know, i think the real challenge too with this is to to have an aco model of um of justice dollars so just like now the country again i like to use frames that people are already familiar with in order to understand what the new uh, chapter is going to be if we pay uh, accountable care organizations to reduce the rehospitalization rate by being, quote, at risk for those lives, they're going to do a better job at the follow up, at the stabilization, at the monitoring, and at the connection. And if they don't do that, their DRG is going to drop and the risk is going to be great and they're financially going to be penalized. So, that's the model that we're going into with an abandon right now. And as you know, CMS is drafting all these new value-based kind of um, definitions. And I think R988 can be positioned not just as an effort to get more codes and more reimbursement, which of course we need to, to ramp this up, but ultimately give me a little bit of the existing budget that is not uh, you know, 40% of the police time is spent transporting people. You know, how much a percent of our, you know, uh, judicial time is spent uh, dealing with people who fundamentally just have a mental health issue, but because of uh, dint to the fact we don't have a mental health system, by default, the criminal justice system ends up being the, bur the ones that are burdened with that. Um, and then you marry that with the kind of right wing, you know, the right on crime folks, which are now made up of governors like Nathan Deal, Newt Gingrich, others who are saying that this old strategy of paying for uh, more incarceration is stupid, right. and in their words, on the taxpayer, because, you know, finally we're appealing on their um, taxpayer champion uh, issue. 
uh, as opposed to their law and order side and say, this doesn't make any financial sense. And as we know, people, we don't address law and order because people are not getting the rehabilitation they need in order to actually not only reduce re-incarceration, but to reduce re-victimization of people out there in the community. And those numbers are very strong. So I think we're just really in the in the middle of this. And 988 is the key that will unlock a lot of the transformation in our um, in our health system. And I have to say, a parity was a, a paradigm shift. But since parity, I think this 988 thing represents the single greatest um, lever to fundamentally change the direction of, of uh, mental health uh, through the, the work that you guys are doing, pioneering a new emergency response system. It's galvanizing, isn't it? I love, I love hearing you describe that. So uh, Patrick, we do want to get to uh, our, our round table folks to make some reflections, but that one thing that I, I don't think you've talked much about yet uh, certainly, MHP AEA is one uh, standpoint. You also, rep, your team was referencing the straightforward coverage mandates in uh, S1902 that Cortez Masto and Cornyn. You want to speak a little bit about that opportunity? Well, um, as I said, trying to you know lock in templates that can garner um, political support is is really where we're going to be because these things build on each other. I like I, as you mentioned, I was uh, named to, if you can believe it, the Trump Commission on the Opioid Crisis, which that. by the way did donuts on this. But the good news is I got Christie to put in a bunch of language on civil and monetary penalties and enforcement of parity. And and guess what? Acosta, who was Trump's uh, labor secretary, signed off on it. So. Like when it comes to us getting in this uh, l latest uh, reconciliation bill, it wasn't like our Republican friends could back out of it because they were already on the record. So whether you can get certain bills passed, once you start level setting a new expectation for what the template's gonna look like, that lifts the understanding by and large for the direction we need to go in. and. Uh, as one model, like we did at the Kennedy Forum, this parity track, which just simply monitors uh, what's a state statute look like, what's their regulatory infrastructure looks like, and what's their um, you know case law looks like. Okay, I would recommend maybe we can you guys you know, noodle on this a lot more, obviously, but if we can get some templates, which is what you're doing. And we can create a, a metric which all states with all your members can start to say, how is my state doing? Whoa, geez, you know, we're getting way down the list. Washington State so much higher. California's doing this, you know, Vermont's doing this, whatever. Even in some cases, Texas or Florida are doing this. What we could do is create that pressure. Mm -hmm. And so I I and a lot of people don't need to know the details that frankly, your members on this call have great proficiency and literacy in, right? They just need to know, how are we ranking? They don't need to know what all the metrics are. They just need to know, geez, all these other states are doing this. Why are we doing this in Arkansas or Tennessee or New York? So I would encourage that. I'm sure it's part of your uh, rollout plan, but um, I like the uh, feedback already um, uh, from Tennessee there. That's the kind of thing we need to do is, um, you know, compare and put pressure on each other, a little peer, peer pressure in a, in a positive way um, to, to, to up our game. And by the way, I know Angela is going to lead this. Angela has just been fantastic at As NAMI you. for years, and she is just the right person and working not only with you guys, but inseparable on the children's mental health crisis, which again is going to be a huge lever for us to get crisis response because people for adults maybe ah geez those people are the ones to blame for this but everyone knows this gen z issue that's going to be the defining issue i think for our gen z's generation or children's mental health is mental health and that is one way another quote narrative we can wrap this all around so with that i'll Turn it, turn it back. Thanks. Well, and, and Patrick, uh, Angela, like yourself, has brought her lived and family experience and passion into this work. Uh, Angela, 
uh, wow, the leadership that Patrick has brought to this work from the, 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 the Great Recession, the economic crisis, which rode Obama's rescue plan, rode on Patrick's parity bill, and to see that have the impact yesterday. Angela, your reflections and comments on Patrick's uh, uh, leadership and, and this, this focus on parity. Oh my gosh, it's just such an honor to follow Patrick. You know, I, I just remember from years ago, I mean, Patrick has always passionately articulated uh, when I think the moral imperative of parody for years and years and years and understood that it has such a structural impact. And, and I'm so glad for everybody who put in links in the chat to the MAPIA report to Congress that came out yesterday to the Senate Bill 1902, as well as the Washington State Bill, uh, Senate Bill 5618. Yesterday's MAPIA report to Congress was so damning, as Patrick said, because it clearly showed a pattern of non-compliance by health insurers across the country. And this is a federal law that's been in place since 2008. This is not new, people. And the what is really disturbing about this is that that pattern of discriminatory coverage really results in untold trauma and tragedy. Um, and, and David, you mentioned... A, Myself, so many other people bring their lived experience to this. And, and we know the lives lost because we have a system that has treated mental health and substance use services as something separate, as unequal. And that has to change. And if it isn't paid for, this is, I think, one of the key points that people that don't hear loudly enough that Patrick keeps articulating, and that is, if it isn't paid for, it isn't happening. And we cannot continue to rely on a public system to do what the larger healthcare system ought to be stepping up to the table and doing. We need all payers at the table. And uh, another thing that I heard Patrick say that I think is so important is we also need to make it financially viable for plans to do this. And, and one of the things I love about Senate Bill 1902 at the federal level and Washington State's uh, SB 5618 is by requiring all plants to cover mental health crisis services. And as some people put in the chat, maybe we should be calling that urgent and emergent services rather than crisis services. But anyway, right, covering those services and those providers is so essential. And, and when we require all, all payers, all plans to cover them, that really means that none of them are disadvantaged by financially by covering those services. Whereas if you only require a few people to cover, it creates a financial disadvantage for them. So I think that's an important concept and we need to grasp it because this is good for the economy, <laughs> it's good for the health and well being of our country. And we really need to make sure that we're demanding all payers come to the table for crisis services. Um, you know, bills like this don't create parity across the board, uh, they advance parity incrementally but it is still very significant. And I'll just by end by saying, we all need to be standing shoulder to shoulder with Patrick and demanding parity across the country. Love it, thank you, Angela. Patrick, your team and, and some of the questions that we were talking about beforehand talked about, look, it's time for providers to bill for these services and regulators to enforce it. Uh, let's go to Laurel Stein. Uh, Laurel, are you with us from AFSP, Senior Vice President of Public Policy? Laurel, we have about a minute if you have a comment reflection on uh, on this uh, discussion of parity. Um, yes, hi, sorry I'm off video um, since I'm out of the office and out of my home right now. But, um, and, and thank you for calling on me. I didn't know you were gonna call on me. Um, but um, I just wanna say that um, we salute um, uh, Patrick Kennedy um, and in the work and the leadership that he's shown over the years um, um, consistently. And i um, very pleased to hear Angela's remarks. Um, AFSP, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevent um, Prevention is an active partner 
in uh, many of the coalitions, primarily the mental health liaison group and others, um, um, pushing for um, not only Department of Labor having civil monetary penalties to enforce, but making sure there's network adequacy, um, legislation such as S-1902, which we're all standing behind and very pleased to, um, to have inseparable leading this charge on a better response. Um, and collectively, um, this should be a provide priority for all of us. It is a long time that we not only realize the merits and, and of, of, of true parity, uh, mental health and substance abuse, but also advance mental health and substance abuse care so that emergencies, crises, um, um, where we don't, where individuals don't get to that point um, and that we focus on early intervention and prevention. So I thank you um, for the work that you're doing um, with the Crisis Jam and bringing all these leaders together um, and AFSP stands ready to, um, to work in solidarity. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Angela. Thank you, Laurel. And if everyone can use your virtual applause, harps, thank yous to uh, Patrick. Uh, uh, so appreciate, Patrick, you joining us today and you continuing to lead this charge. Well, thank you, Dave, and thank you, everybody. And, uh, you know, what I said is the pressure when these plans can't comply, the ideal is as we come to them with a solution to get out of jail. And, and that's no, <laughs> that's a double entendre there because literally we don't want people to have to go to jail to get help. And uh, we should get them to step up and fund this stuff, especially when the Millman report laid the foundation for their, there's lack of parity across, but the obligations of the law still are there, which means <laughs> we have leverage to bargain with. And that's what I would encourage us to figure out how to maximize to, to Angela's point. But thank you so much, David. Keep up the great work, everybody. Thank you so much, Patrick. So with that, let's uh, let's just keep this theme going uh, related to um, uh, justice, um, uh, fairness, civil rights, et cetera. Kevin, uh, Stephanie, talk a little bit about your interview with Kevin Martone this week uh, in Crisis Talk around the issue of homelessness up against the challenges of crisis. And vice versa. Yeah, so uh, yep, I spoke with Kevin Martone, he's the executive director at Technical Assistance Collaborative. And this conversation that I had is right on par uh, with today's presentation. Uh, we spoke about what's 988 on the horizon, who will respond to the call um, when a homeless person is in crisis. And also, you know, with looking at language uh, in the chat, there's a lot about emergencies versus crisis. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Another component that we don't think about is how different systems perceive a crisis or an emergency and how that actually um, filters in. So how does housing look at the terminology crisis? How does behavioral health look at the word crisis and, and the lens and, and what happens next in terms of services? Um, we also talked about racism and biases. And Kevin, had there was a quote that really uh, got to me where he said, um, will a 911 call about a white man who is delusional and homeless likely get transferred to 988? Um, and will a 911 call about a black man experiencing the same stay with 911 and result in police dispatch because the caller perceives the man to be dangerous? So a lot of this is about a feedback loop, some way to collect data. Kevin, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you know, listen, I mean, it, it, this is really complex work, right? And, you know, it, it's important for whether it's 988 mobile um, stabilization programs, you know, you have to drill down on lots of different issues, substance use disorders, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, but also homelessness, and really understanding, you know, those issues that go into it. And there's just so much cross system collaboration and planning that needs to occur. And, you know, particularly in the data and metrics piece of it, you know, it's understanding you know, who callers may be or, or, you know, who's presenting in a crisis scenario and what their needs are. And at the end of the day, a crisis system has to be able to respond and serve a person. And, you know, oftentimes a person who's experiencing homelessness has, um, you know, even more extenuating complex uh, uh, situations. And, you know, those systems really need to come together. And a lot of that has to, you know, deal with data. Um, and just, you know, point to add there too, is, you know, when we're thinking about homelessness and, and responding to people who are homeless, you know, on one hand, we have to think about it at the clinical level and what kind of unique needs they have, um, but also provider level coordination issues so that, you know, the, the work's done up front in terms of crisis providers really responding and 
and working with homelessness systems or even law enforcement and how law enforcement's working with people who are homeless and encampments and things like that. And then just the general systems level issues. How, how can we make sure that our systems are working together, you know, so that when a crisis, uh, you know, provider, you know, either is trying to figure out how to triage a call, systems level work that's done up front to make sure that, you know, there are, are ways to help people with homelessness um, on the spot. And, that, and that's, that's a tricky issue. And I think those are some of the points we tried to really address in the article. Kevin, thanks so much. Uh, Kevin, uh, I was talking with Brian earlier, and he was talking about what a friend you've been to Nashville and TAC has been. Uh, uh, and he was talking about the leadership of various New Jersey mental health commissioners over the years and your focus on housing and homelessness. Uh, can you say just a quick word about uh, why, why New Jersey uh, has such an approach? Well, I, you know, I mean, um, uh, I always sort of had the approach that housing is clinical um, and it really uh, helps a person recover. It helps them in their recovery, their treatment and things like that. And without housing, you're just up against the odds. And so I know at least when I was in New Jersey and I know Valerie and her current role and her team there have really continued to value you know, addressing affordable housing, supportive housing for people with serious mental illness who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Um, you know, and you know when you, um, you know, it doesn't solve all the problems, but when you look at the impact and the outcomes that access to housing and good supports can have, it goes a long way in helping people. You know, and and, and from a crisis scenario or a crisis perspective, um, it is preventative in nature. It helps to mitigate and prevent crises. And it is also a, a resolution to it, you know, so if someone's experiencing a behavioral health crisis, if they have a safe, decent place to go back to, um, it is going to facilitate their recovery from that crisis or emergency. Thank you so much, Kevin. And thank you, Stephanie. Let's go to the crisis trivia hot seat. And this week we have Dr. Eric Rafla Yuan. Uh, Eric, thanks so much for, for jumping in. Are, are you with us, Eric? I'm here. Uh, so is this your first time in the hot seat? It is. Uh, we're going to ask the audience. Uh, you're going to get their sense. And then you can phone a friend. But the uh, question really came from our Crisis Jam community and uh, someone who emailed Karen and myself about the challenges some federal and state policies prevent the hiring of individuals with certain barrier crimes. And that barrier crime list can be long. Uh, a lot of times it can include intent with possession, et cetera. Uh, possession with intent, uh, which can lead to uh, individuals being blocked. So how do we promote peer specialists with these backgrounds being an active part of the 988 and crisis workforce? Uh, so today we're going to focus on Georgia. In 2020, Georgia's Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities implemented, implemented a new peer employment policy with a strong focus on, uh, so they were trying to get at this issue, uh, A, individual assessment, uh, B, a history of a felony versus misdemeanor, C, a, a felony but a violent one, or D, uh, crimes of abuse and or neglect. So one of those four was the focus of this new policy. Let's ask the audience uh, to see uh, what folks think. If everybody could do a quick uh, choose one of these and submit that. We'll give about 10 seconds, Eric. Uh, and let give you a sense of how the audience feels on this. So Karen, let's uh, share with Eric uh, the audience uh, view of this question. So Eric, uh, A, B, C, D in that order. Uh, the audience is a little bit mixed, but the, the preference is uh, maybe a hope for individual assessment. What, what do you think was the, the, the answer here? Do you want to phone a friend or take a shot? I'm just going to go with A, in part because that's what I that's what I hope things are, are moving towards. Uh, well, and Eric, uh, hence the uh, the reason we uh, uh, focused on this question uh, today. Any conviction renders a person ineligible for 12 months, but beyond that, there's a framework of guidelines and timelines, and an overarching uh, opportunity with a strong individualized assessment process, which looks at the context of criminal history. Uh, Wendy White Tigreen, you uh, were the one who shared with us this policy and Karen's gonna drop it or uh, Wendy can drop it in the text chat. But uh, Wendy, you wanna make a couple of comments about this uh, effort uh, in Georgia to uh, engage the broadest appropriate workforce possible. 
Sure, David, I'll just share. It was uh, fascinating to hear um, Patrick Kennedy mention Governor Deal yeah. uh, because Governor Deal uh, did have a very strong commitment to individuals um, who had had this history uh, to have an opportunity to, to be um, strong and um, recovery-minded and substantial citizens. And so um, it was under his administration that uh, we were able to partner with many folks and um, including a lot of lawyers uh, in order to create this policy, which we feel like really gives individuals uh, with recovery uh, a chance to provide meaningful work in our system. And um, as everyone has been mentioning, we need the workforce. And uh, we, we so value recovery. Um, I know all of you do, but particularly we've had this longstanding uh, commitment to this in Georgia. So um, I look forward to this group uh, having more opportunity to learn about this and I'll, I'll drop the policy into the chat. Oh, and thank you so much, Wendy. Wendy, you connected us with Tony Sanchez with Faces of Voice in Recovery that uh, uh, Stephanie will be interviewing and hope to get him on as a featured uh, going forward. So thank you for your work on this. Eric, you go away keeping the streak alive of Crisis Trivia Hot Seat. And I can tell you, we're going to double down and make it harder next week. We want to split the audience on this. We didn't do that today. So uh, next week, uh, if you're in the Trivia Hot Seat, expect a split audience. But Eric, uh, you, you had people all over the place and you, and you went with your gut on this. So thank you so much. Thanks, David. Thanks, Wendy. Great. So let's uh, go to John Palmeria, update from SAMHSA. Uh, hi, David. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, really, <clears throat> excuse me, really inspired by the conversation today, thinking about opportunities for sustainable funding for crisis services and, and uh, different points uh, that we can leverage to move that forward. So um, really inspired by Patrick's comments as well. Uh, just from uh, SAMHSA's perspective, just wanted to provide a very quick update on uh, our co-sponsorship work with Nashbit and a number of other uh, partners uh, really working toward um, refining our uh, work on 988 readiness uh, and assessing, refining uh, the criteria by which we're sort of defining readiness. Um, and that's, that work has accelerated and I know has been a, a very heavy lift for all of those who are involved. And so we are extremely appreciative um, of all that work, um, knowing that it will, uh, with the expertise uh, of all of you, will make the product that much better. Um, and obviously the work has accelerated as we approach uh, the first part of our um, convening planning, which uh, will be February 8th. Um, as we as we again work to refine and syndicate um, some of that readiness work. Um, I also just wanted to add on to that, that we are aware that there's a need for um, a bit of a deeper dive with respect to the needs around tribes and the relationship between tribes and states in 988 um, and understanding that there are a lot of complexities um, in that space um, and are undertaking uh, uh, a lot of different engagements uh, in that in that area, and some additional planning um, that's really more focused on on the needs of tribes uh, with respect to 980 implementation. So there'll be uh, more more on that topic uh, in the coming weeks. Um, and then I'm going to just go ahead and turn it over to Richard uh, and or James, who might have some additional uh, brief updates. I am. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Uh, so uh, this is Richard McKeon. Let me just start uh, you know, by echoing John about how wonderful it was to hear uh, from Congressman Kennedy uh, earlier um, in, the, in the crisis jam. I had the honor 20 years ago of working as a congressional fellow in the office of US Senator Paul Wellstone, who, um, you know, for whom mental health parity was um, a, a deep, deep concern. And Patrick was the House Democratic lead on that and has spent decades working for this. And I also very much agreed, and, I th and, and Samsa agrees, with, uh, you know, with his point about the uh, transformative potential of 988, a point we first made in our report to the FCC when we were asked under the uh, Hotline Improvement Act to um, advise the FCC on the feasibility and potential effectiveness of a three-digit number and where SAMHSA came out strongly 
in favor of the three-digit number that became 988. Just two other things quickly. You know, one area of that transformation has to do with the relationship between 988 and 911. So we have multiple lines of effort in that regard, but we are also approaching it with some humility. Most of us don't live in the 911 world, so we um, are trying to understand that space um, and the challenges from their perspective, have ongoing communications with the Office of Emergency uh, Medical Services. This is a piece of the work under the co-sponsorship uh, agreement um, uh, that's being undertaken as well. And then um, finally, I just wanted to mention, you know, on, regarding the issue of data, which has been mentioned a couple of times, and we let people know previously about the mortality and morbidity weekly report that came out from the CDC that was co-authored with SAMHSA's representative from our Center for Behavioral Statistics and Quality that gave information on suicidal ideation, plans and attempts for every single state. Um, and the NISDA system is an absolute gold mine. There was also a report released recently National trends of mental health care among U.S. adults who attempted suicide in the past 12 months by a number of several excellent researchers. And what they concluded, looking at data going up to 2019, was that although suicide attempts have been increasing, the proportion of them getting mental health care has not been increasing. Um, and it just underscores the significance of the work that we're doing to improve our crisis systems and to improve the linkages uh, with the behavioral health system more generally. Um, you know, so as Patrick indicated, every American can get the help that they need. So, um, and finally, I don't think that James is on the call, but um, just a reminder that the state grants with every state and um, a number of the territories are eligible for that funding, uh, that that grant opportunity closes at the end of the month. We certainly hope that every single state uh, will apply. And that, along with the money provided to, vet, uh, to vet, uh, a Vibrant uh, for the Lifeline Administration, uh, really, I think, underscores this administration's commitment to making our 988 response as strong as it can possibly be. Thank you so much, Richard. And it sounds like it is very much SAMHSA's, uh, as you and James and John have said, your intention to award 50 to 56 of those uh, grants uh, based upon uh, the number of submissions you get. So this is not competitive in the usual sense. That's exactly right. Uh, and Richard, we're, we're going on, uh, gosh, it's almost been two years since you, you sent me an email and we had the very first noon Eastern time meeting uh, around COVID. We, we may want to come back to some of the pressures on crisis providers about that in coming meetings, but we'll table that for now. Let's go to Brian Hepburn with uh, a focus on the states. Uh, thank you, David. And uh, David, another excellent jam. Thank you for all the work that you do to make this happen. Uh, and for your coordination during the meeting. Uh, parity is a major issue for states. There's a, a frustration across states because as you know, behavioral health uh, is able to see the regularly the problems with parity. However, uh, states, uh, uh, the, the uh, health insurance commissioners often look at complaints and they will say there aren't complaints coming in on parity. So we're hoping that this new emphasis on parity uh, will help sensitize the field and make it easier for people to, uh, to make changes regarding parity, which we know have such an impact uh, on individuals that we serve. Uh, I also wanted to thank SAMHSA for the work that they're doing uh, it's our pleasure to be working with them on trying to uh, move forward the, with the co-sponsorship in 988 and crisis services and trying to get states and organizations uh, ready through this planning. Um, so with that, let me move to the next slide. 
Thank you. I just wanted to highlight a paper in 2021. It uh, was done by Dr. Pinels and uh, was uh, on law enforcement and crisis services, past lessons for new partnerships and the future of 988. The paper looks at the past relationship that uh, 911 has had with, excuse me, with behavioral health and looks at uh, the role as we move forward to 988 and uh, the fact that we will continue to need law enforcement's involvement and we need to be sensitive to that, uh, that role change and working with 911, working with law enforcement in order to make sure that the, the role that is needed for them to be uh, playing in terms of addressing individuals that may uh, have a more immediate risk to themselves and a risk to others that uh, law enforcement continues to be involved. Uh, I let's just wanna go through quickly a couple of the recommendations from that paper. Uh, one was to uh, continue to emphasize the importance of working with law enforcement Second was the importance of training and cross-training in order to successfully accomplish uh, the change in the role. The third is to look at the uh, trauma that uh, is created in first responders that uh, we, we sometimes forget about the, uh, the impact of the first, on the first responders and uh, to try and look at them with a trauma-informed lens. Uh, looking at the importance of peers being involved with law enforcement uh, and the importance of being able to identify and predict what are the high risk encounters in which law enforcement will continue to be needed. We know that we can't move to 988 with no law enforcement involvement. We have to have law enforcement involved, but we need to be able to predict what their role is and be able to define it carefully. So with that, thank you very much and uh, uh, move to the next section. Thank you, right. David. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, John and Richard and uh, Samson Najbit, your partnership and your continued tenacious focus on, uh, on this transformative opportunity is just so inspiring. Sarah Corcoran, uh, give us an update on what's happening at the federal level related to policy. Yeah, um, thanks, David. And I'll just flag quickly a couple of upcoming hearings. Uh, in the Senate, there's going to be a hearing in the HELP Committee next Tuesday, February 1st, starting at 10 a.m. Uh, that will be live streamed from the, the Senate HELP website, uh, which should be help.senate.gov. Uh, there's another hearing, and that one's on mental health and substance use and some of the SAMHSA uh, grants. Uh, the next day, they're just announced this morning, there's going to be a ways and means hearing also on mental health, uh, the mental health crisis currently going on. Um, the panelist list has not been released. That uh, announcement did just come out this morning, and that will be next Wednesday, February 2nd, also at 10 a.m. Uh, and then we're hearing that the Senate finance hearing that is rescheduled originally, I think, was supposed to be today uh, on kids' mental health uh, should be February 8th is the date they're looking at for that Surgeon General uh, first panel in the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, that second panel is gonna happen sometime later in February, but we'll, we'll keep an eye out. Those have not been officially re-announced, but that's the, the date that we're hearing through uh, rumors that I'll be able to update on more next week. Terrific, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, we had a, a, another great uh, map update and a lot going on. Uh, Hannah, uh, Steph, uh, update from NAMI about the uh, legislative movement in states. Sure, this is uh, Stephanie with NAMI. I will just be very brief, um, just mentioning that there are several um, new bills in uh, states to take note of, um, including uh, New Jersey has refiled uh, their 988 legislation from last year. Uh, Hawaii has a 988 task force bill. Uh, West Virginia has 988 legislation, I believe for the first time, and that includes a a 988 uh, fee of 11 cents. Also just taking note that several hearings are uh, 988 legislation next week, including for Maryland's legislation um, and also uh, New Jersey's Senate bill. Um, and all of this is in our dashboard, which I will put in the chat. Great, that dashboard's terrific. We're also going to add this map to our list of uh, where the state stat cards are. 
on the uh, crisis talk dot, uh, the crisis now dot talk website. So more to come. Thanks so much, uh, Steph and Fernami for that ongoing movement. I'll just end today with uh, the upcoming presentations. Uh, Dr. Michael Hogan and Stephanie Hepburn next week on their Scattergood article, Correcting System Disparities. They're going to do an interview style talk, which I think you'll find terrific. Uh, Dr. Robert Williamson, uh, a day in the life crisis receiving. Now, this is an organization that receives every single referral. They're never too full. The person never has too much this, that, or the other thing. They take every single referral and they do that dozens of times every single day in both Phoenix and Tucson. So, uh, you know, Dr. Margie Balfour, you've met Dr. Chris Carson, but I look forward to introducing you to Dr. Robert Williamson, another one of their medical leaders uh, in a couple of weeks. So thanks so much. Terrific uh, uh, work today with uh, this uh, moral imperative and a essential services approach to a framework for all. So thanks for joining us and look forward to seeing you next time.